I'm really excited to be here uh, and to present uh, this, this thing that we've actually been working on trying to make exist for quite some time now. Um, so welcome and let me introduce to you what this Scala Center thing is all about. Um, it's an organization that we've been trying to, or it took us several months to create, uh, Addy PFL. Um, but uh, first, let's just point out like the most important fact about this organization. Uh, we are a not-for-profit establishment at EPFL. I'll tell you what EPFL is in a second if you don't know. Oh, it's, uh, sorry, this is uh, old. It's been launched about uh, three months ago now. So we're about three months old. Uh, and like I said, most important fact about this whole thing is that we're not-for-profit. Um, and EPFL is a university in Switzerland. Um, this is EPFL. Uh, so we don't live, we're, we have nothing to do with San Francisco. We, we, uh, we're not light bent or type safe. Uh, we are a university in Switzerland. Um, and this is actually the inspiration behind the Scala logo. Uh, this is where Martin uh, first sort of came up with the original design uh, of Scala. Uh, and it was this little academic language that came out of this building, basically. And so now we have a center at EPFL. And you might ask, well, all right, we have, uh, we have this company called uh, Lightbend, so why do we need a center now? Well, Scala is growing in popularity, uh, as Martin rightly pointed out yesterday. So uh, as, as the years roll on, there are more and more job ads being posted, and it just keeps on sort of increasing at a, at a sort of ridiculous rate. Um, and actually, what I found uh, that was kind of funny was that Scala is even at the moment more popular on, on Indeed and job advertisements than data scientists. I mean, I, I'd like to point out there's a small, uh, probably a small correlation between uh, data science and Scala given, given Spark exists. Uh, and I mean, I, I, I believe Dean Wampler and Andy Petrella, or just Dean Wampler, I don't know, uh, they have a talk talking about uh, how and why this is indeed true, why Scala is the good, the good sort of lingua franca for, for data science. But anyway, it's pretty cool. So data science is an exploding thing uh, and Scala seems to be exploding at around the same rate that's pretty cool it's also uh, in the stack overflow developer survey I don't know if you guys saw this uh, a lot of people have it's very cool so basically stack overflow did this this I mean I'm sure lots of you probably uh, gave responses to this to this survey but uh, over 50,000 people over 50,000 developers participated in this survey uh, and Scala was one of it came out as one of the top five most loved languages uh, so you know, it, it's one that actually gets fewer complaints despite some of the, uh, some of the anger sometimes Scala draws. So still, I, I still haven't answered the question, why, why should a, a center exist? Um, well, unlike other successful open source programming languages, uh, we've never, until now, we've never had a not-for-profit uh, sort of gender, I'm sorry, a vendor-neutral steward. Lightbed does a really good job of, of keeping the development and whatnot uh, of, of stable Scala going. They, they, uh, they're responsible for binary compatibility happening. That would have probably never happened if everything stayed at EPFL all by itself. And all of us probably wouldn't be here today because it would be really difficult to develop, uh, to develop projects on top of Scala if we didn't have these wonderful binary and source compatibility guarantees, right? Um, but Lightband can't spend all of their develop uh, development cycles on, on sort of free open source development. That by itself doesn't pay the bills for, for a regular company to keep on going. And uh, not only that, but Scala is actually growing beyond just the JVM uh, by by itself. Uh, it's more than just the 2.x compiler alone. So now we compile to JavaScript and soon, uh, well sort of soon since we already, uh, you know, the Scala Native project has been announced and there's a, the, it's, it's been open source, we uh, uh, compile to, to LLVM. Uh, and of course if you'd like to hear more about that, I think Dennis has a talk. I'm not sure if it's today or tomorrow. Um, but still, we need to broaden our focus and open up Scala to, to more I'm sorry, open up, um, open up more of Scala to more of Scala stakeholders. We need somebody to, to deal with some of this stuff. Uh, libraries are, are kind of important. Nobody's been really uh, focusing on, on, you know, making sure that the standard library is, is you know, clean and taken care of as, as much as it needs to be. So we, there needs to be more effort invested uh, in sort of all of this open source important stuff that we all need, uh, but one, one company can't do it all by itself. So the, the Scala Center aims to be something that can help in, in, in some of these spaces, right? So we have two goals at the Scala Center. Um, this is really kind of, I'll show you the mission statement uh, in a second, but number one, we're focused on open source, open source community, uh, and number two, uh, education. But I'd like to really uh, highlight that when I say community, we mean uh, really, sorry, 
we mean really everybody. Community means everybody. Community means enormous company that has uh, a thousand Scala developers that's on some old version of Scala. Community also means uh, some brilliant weekend tinkerer um, playing around with some academic ideas published in an Oleg paper and translating them to Scala. Like, this is everybody. Everybody is the community. So the Scala Center as a not-for-profit, not profit non-profit steward is committed to acting in the interest of, of every side of this, of, this, of, this, of, this, of this world of Scala. Um, and just to read the mission statement um, that we were sort of founded under, so independently guide and support the entire Scala community. Independently means that we are not controlled by any one company. We do not do things one company tells us to do. It's for the good of everybody, literally, all the time. Uh, and to coordinate and develop open source libraries and tools for the benefit of the overall Scala community, so again, for everybody, and to provide a deep quality and freely available educational materials for Scala. Uh, since we're founded at a university, it's rather important that we do educational things. That's what edu uh, universities like to do, right? So the, this is our mission statement, uh, and uh, I'll just iterate through the, what, what I mean by these two things. Um, but first, I'll start with education. Um, so I, I believe probably a lot of people are familiar with these MOOCs that we've um, founded back in 2012. Uh, there were two of them. First, there was this MOOC called ProgFun, and then there was a MOOC called Reactive. Uh, and until now, those two MOOCs that were on this old version of Coursera had, up to f uh, had over 400,000 people registered to take them. And they also had the highest completion rates uh, ac across all MOOCs that grew to their size. Each iteration had between uh, 40 and, and 60,000 students enrolled. Uh, and and this, these MOOCs actually served as the main free educational resource for learning Scala. Pretty in-depth, uh, automated programming, uh, grading, and all of that. Uh, and here's just a, a, a little plot that I like to show sometimes. Um, this is an up-to-date uh, graph from this website here. Um, basically, this is a, a researcher who's keeping an eye on, on what's going on in the world of MOOCs. And uh, our, our MOOC is actually right here. So uh, on, on the, on the x-axis of this graph, this is the size uh, of, of people enrolled in the MOOC. So here is 0, 100,000, 200,000. Uh, and this is the completion rate. So as you can see, as MOOCs get bigger, uh, fewer and fewer people complete the course. But when they stay really small, uh, around half of people complete the course. So we're here. Uh, so f of all MOOCs, uh, in the, in the 50,000, 60,000 student range, we have really the highest completion rate at around 20%. So that's, that's really impressive. So our MOOCs seem to be rather popular uh, and, and widely loved. So, uh, well, what's the first thing we do as part of the Scala Center? We offer a new Scala mini degree that uh, is offered in partnership with Coursera. Uh, it's composed of four courses. Two of them are new. So uh, the first two courses are sort of reorganized material from the other two courses that have already been uh, have already been released in the last few years. But these two new courses I'll cover in a moment. And there's uh, something called a capstone project, which is a four to five week significant uh, project. It's a programming like a programming assignment. So it's more like a kind of like a thesis project in some sense. So it's not uh, if you if you've taken any of the other MOOCs before, you have uh, usually like. Uh, one, one Scala file or two Scala files and you implement some methods, you fill in some, me some method definitions, right? Um, this is going to be a much bigger sort of programming assignment. Um, and another cool thing about these MOOCs that we're, we're launching, or we, just, uh, we actually just launched, uh, is that we're doing it on this new platform, which is a great, uh, this new Coursera platform, which is a great improvement over the last version. Um, it's very much more modern. Uh, and also, it's, I'm not sure if this is the correct term for what it is. It's basically on demand, which means that you can enroll in the course today, start taking the course today. Um, they have something called cohorts, where you, if you enroll today, you are in a cohort of other learners that enrolled in the same two-week period, so you're all taking the course together. And every two weeks, they have new cohorts. So I, I, it's a little bit confusing, the terminology, if you log onto the website. I'm not sure if it's called on-demand or a session or whatever. But the, 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 bo the bottom line is that you don't have to wait six months uh, for the next rerun of this course. It's basically always running. So you can start this course whenever you want, today, tomorrow, two weeks from now, three months. You're, it's always going to be available, always going to be running, and other people should be taking it alongside of you. Um, in addition to that, um, so this whole, what I, what I, I mentioned that this was a mini degree. Uh, on Coursera, they call it a specialization. Um, this is what it looks like. 
So uh, you might see that it costs some money to enroll in some of these, these courses, uh, but, but what you should walk away with right now is that it's still for free. Uh, Coursera is trying to uh, you know, return on, on, on investments that have been made, but basically they offer a paid uh, certificate where they verify your identity, etc., uh, and that, 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 is, that is available for a fee, yet uh, you can still uh, find, if you, if you go to the individual course pages, you can still enroll in all of this stuff for free. So just be aware, it's, it's still for free, just without the certificate. And um, as Martin mentioned yesterday, uh, we, still, we still do the automated grading, and our automated grading is being, you know, is being used in the, the upcoming two courses in addition in the, uh, in the final capstone project. So uh, I mean, this is actually, we've actually did like a little study and we found that these automated graders uh, uh, really are a big part of the retention of our courses. People really participate and come back because of these automated graders, so you'll be happy to know that we're not getting rid of them, we're improving them. Uh, and we're developing them for, for all of our courses, basically. And uh, if you haven't taken the course already, uh, we check not only for the correctness of, of your code, did you consider all the corner cases, did you, did you do everything that the assignment asked you to do, uh, but we also check for style. We run it through a little style checker to tell you, say, hey, uh, don't use VARs, don't, don't cast anything, you can use a pattern match, for example. Um, these are the four courses. So um, course one, this Functional Programming Principles in Scala course, is a subset of the original ProgFund course. There's nothing really different from it. Uh, number two is bits and pieces of, of the Reactive course and uh, uh, the rest of the material from ProgFund. Uh, so if you've taken Reactive and if you've taken ProgFund, uh, basically that's a superset of course one and two. And we've actually uh, got confirmation from Coursera that if you did pay for a certificate for, for either of these two courses, that you will have credit transferred over. Uh, so you shouldn't have to pay again. Um, just so you know, this is finally resolved. Uh, and the, new, the two new courses are called uh, Parallel Programming and Big Data Analysis in Spark and Scala, or Scala and Spark. Parallel Programming is taught by uh, Professor Victor Kunchak and Alex Prokopet, who is the guy who uh, authored Parallel Collections some years ago. Uh, and I'm teaching this course on Big Data Analysis in Scala and Spark. Uh, I'll go into kind of what these courses cover in a moment. Uh, so first, uh, if you haven't taken the, the Functional Programming Principles and Scala course, uh, the idea behind this course is really to cover the basic sort of uh, kind of ground level concepts in functional programming to teach you how to write some purely functional programs using recursion, pattern matching, and higher order functions. Uh, it's also, it actually, uh, Martin also teaches how to combine functional programming with uh, objects and classes, uh, how to design immutable data structures, and how to reason about functions. Um, and he goes a little bit into, you know, uh, uh, types. Uh, and the second part of the course, I told you this was a little bit of a, a mixture of, of reactive and, and, and prog fun. So the idea of, of course number two, it's called Functional Program Design in Scala. Uh, the idea is to recognize and apply these design principles uh, and apply them to, to little functional programs, design functional libraries and APIs, and we, uh, we also add, we add some stuff uh, from the world of functional reactive applications, so we do things like futures and whatnot. Um, this is all in, in this course, so uh, four expressions, monads, lazy evaluation, uh, and timely effects, so the, the bit from reactive about futures is in here. Um, and the new courses, so uh, they actually kind of connect to one another. So if, if you notice, uh, they're both about some kind of parallelism. Uh, so in this course, in parallel programming, we start with task parallelism and go into uh, data parallelism. Uh, Alex Prokopetz has written this book, which is pretty good. Uh, I really enjoy it, actually. I, I, I highly recommend it. Um, and the idea is that uh, we teach, we start with, with task parallelism, get into data parallelism, uh, and, and we, we, we go from uh, just sort of the basic definitions and some basic uh, like task parallel algorithms to data parallel algorithms, explain sort of how uh, Scala collection, uh, parallel collections uh, are designed, how you can design uh, sort of data parallel things like Scala uh, uh, parallel collections, and then uh, just general data structures for parallel computing. Uh, and the fourth course is actually, it actually connects to the, uh, the parallel programming course. So they're basically uh, sort of a prerequisite uh, the parallel programming course is a prerequisite a little bit to the data, program, uh, the data analysis course in Spark. The idea is, well, now that we've taught you what data parallelism is and how it works, now we're going to map all of those concepts to the distributed case because you just learned everything in the shared memory case. So uh, we, we, that's the approach we take. Uh, we go through the basics of, of Spark's programming model and we get into a little bit of the nitty 
gritty. So how do, for example, Spark's, uh, how does Spark's programming model differ from the familiar programming models that you're already used to, like Scala regular sequential collections or parallel collections? When things are shared uh, uh, in shared memory, how does it work? Uh, and we also uh, explain a little bit how to express uh, some, some algorithms that you'd like to use in the world of data analysis in a functional style. And then we go a little bit into the, some of the advanced things that you should care about in Spark, like how not to, to shuffle data, how to avoid things like that, because uh, the benefits of using Spark can be quickly uh, eclipsed by accidentally introducing uh, re-evaluations of lineages or unnecessary shuffles uh, in, in some, some algorithm that you're trying to implement. So those are the four courses. They already started. They started uh, about two weeks ago, uh, two, three weeks ago, in, 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 at the end of May. Uh, and we're expecting course number four and the capstone, uh, hopefully sometime in July or late summer. So this is all in the pipeline. It's coming. Uh, and what's really cool is already in the first three weeks, we have uh, 60, about 63,000 registered learners. So these, I mean, these are people who just free, mostly, vast majority of them are free, and it's growing. So it's really cool. A lot of people are, are finding value in these courses and sort of a big goal of, of uh, the Scala Center and why EPFL decided, okay, it's a good place. We should have the Scala Center here is so that we could ensure that these MOOCs continue going. There are a lot of work to maintain and build up. Okay, so MOOCs. Let's, we're done with the educational side of things. Let's talk about open source. Um, so as a, as, a, as a sort of a bottom line footnote, um, on the side of open source and Scala, I think a lot of things can be improved. And the Scala Center uh, concretely seeks to improve uh, the landscape of Scala's libraries. Uh, we, a, an explicit goal is to, to grow uh, our community, to grow our ecosystem, uh, to cor and to coordinate and direct uh, any sort of open source development of library to or tools, libraries or tools that are of broad benefit to everybody. So things that we all need and care about, we want to make sure that they don't go anywhere. Uh, and of course, also to provide scaffolding to help the community develop, publish, find, and evaluate Scala libraries. Um, before I give you uh, an example of what I mean by this last point, uh, I want to just go a little bit further into this sort of philosophy that we have. Um, why did I, I mention a moment ago that we want to grow these little uh, uh, communities of open source developers? How do we how do we expect to grow? Uh, our ecosystem and whatnot. So we want to start with some of the projects uh, that we're, we're developing in-house. And we want to do this with other people. So, um, so far, uh, I'm going to go through two projects that, that we're working on at the moment. Uh, but we want to be responsible for, for managing a handful of sort of important initiatives and to ensure that things like hardware infrastructure is available for projects that are of, of broad importance to the whole community and that projects maintain uh, you know, some sort of management and that larger goal, uh, goals can be broken into pieces and that contributors can figure out how to participate and help uh, these goals along. And we do this by, uh, for projects that we, we would like to ensure are, are, you know, exist and are continued, uh, for, for at least some period of time, we dedicate one to two Scala Center staff members to engage and participate and help uh, the development of certain projects. And, and really the important point is that we don't want to be uh, the people who control everything. We want to give the control also to the contributors that are participating in the project. We want this to be a community effort uh, and people to come and, and get uh, involved in, in, in some of the projects that we're working on. Um, so we do this by uh, trying to organize little, little uh, groups of, of contributors that work together on growing something that we can all depend on. So we're this is all an experiment. It may not work. We may fail several times uh, at trying to achieve this goal. Uh, but right now, the way that we're doing it uh, is we are, uh, st we've started so far with two of the projects that we're working on. We're really more just one, because we're focusing on one at the moment, uh, to have weekly 30-minute project meetings, a uh, dedicated Slack channel per project, uh, so people who come and go who want to contribute, hey, I want to contribute this small thing. They, they join our little group. We, discuss things in this channel, we maybe have a meeting, they spend uh, an afternoon or an evening or a couple of days uh, adding something and then maybe they disappear again. But we want to add, have some sort of scaffolding and some sort of structure for people to participate in these projects. Uh, and it's working actually uh, so far. Um, oops. Oh, uh, I expect I have the slides out of order. Um, it's working so far and we're gonna, I'm, I'm going to show you uh, in a few moments, um, 
the, the sort of the first big initiative that we've taken on, which is called uh, the Scala Package Index, or Scaladex for short. Um, but since we're talking about social organizing and, and whatnot, uh, I want to go a little bit more into also how we exist, because uh, there's probably a lot of big questions about how, how does funding happen and how do we actually uh, maintain some sort of independence and how do we, you know, how, do, how is it possible for me to say out that we're not for profit and we're getting money from people, right? So uh, the way that, that we were founded uh, was EPFL, since they wanted these MOOCs to exist, they provided seed funding uh, for two people to be employed by the Scala Center. And beyond that, uh, any, any income that we get from industrial uh, members of the Scala Center, uh, we can hire with the money that, that is donated to us. Uh, so we have basically only two possible ways to earn, to earn any money. One is uh, donations, and the other is any sort of uh, revenue share that comes from the MOOCs that pays for our staff members to exist. That's it, this is, this is all the money, this is how, this is how we're funded. Uh, and, and really, John, John said it really nicely. Whoops, John Pretty, who uh, helped me draft some of these documents. He said it really nicely in one of our in one of our documents. So I'm just going to read it to you because you know nobody can say things better. Nobody can explain things better than John, I think. So the Scala Center has been created as an independent, not-for-profit organization within EPFL. The independ our independence comes. Our, our independence from commercial interests is protected by the statute through the Swiss federal restriction that our funding must be made as charitable donations in order for us to receive contributions in their entirety, not linked to any particular initiative. This is a rule that's given down to us from the university. We can't just take money from anybody. Um, and this, so as a result, uh, sort of this, these strict sort of funding rules from being within the university ensures uh, objectivity and accountability for our decision making and allows us to focus on our overall mission, which is to benefit people in general and not to try and make money and ensure that funding is coming in all the time. So it's really for everybody. Uh, and so you might ask, hey, well, companies are giving money. What do they get for it? I mean, we got to give them something, right? Well, no, it's a donation. Um, what, we, what we provide for this money is the right to stay in the loop, uh, guarantee that we're going to make progress with this money uh, somehow that is of the benefit of everybody and we define exactly what that means, uh, and uh, the ability to make recommendations about what they think is important. So we want to listen to organizations that contribute to us, uh, but we're not required to act on every single thing that they, that they tell us to do. Um, I, I don't want to go into a lot of detail about this because I think it starts getting boring real fast, but uh, John, John Pretty wrote up a really nice blog article which I would suggest if you're curious and you want to know more. Uh, he answers a lot of questions about how this process works uh, and about how our first advisory board meeting went in this blog article that he posted on scalalang.org. So if you're interested in, in, in seeing more about how this works, uh, head over to Scalalang and look at the blog. Um, but we have this thing called the advisory board and we have these meetings. Uh, and like I said, the advisory board has the right to give us recommendations or suggest things how we, how we should invest our, our energies. Um, and, and this advisory board is made up of, of people from the Scala Center, uh, people from the, the, the Scala community. Right now, there's just one. We're hoping to grow that to a second uh, Scala community member so that you know, people that aren't just uh, paying members can have a voice as well. Uh, and then these corporate representatives who say, well, look, um, we have all of our infrastructure built on Scala. We really want to make sure that things continue to improve uh, for the entire Scala ecosystem. So, we would like to contribute to this pot of money to hire for open source initiatives uh, in Scala. And that's sort of how it all works. And when we have these meetings, we discuss the Scala Center's progress on the initiatives that we've undertaken, that we've started working on. And then we also discuss together areas of concern that might need attention. Uh, and and you know, we all together discuss and vote on what we think is really the most important for everybody to benefit, not just one company or one industry. Uh, and in order for anybody to make any recommendation, it has to, any recommendation made has to satisfy this condition that really whatever you recommend has to be of general interest and for everybody, right? So, and we're also committed to being fully transparent if you're interested uh, in seeing our agendas, our minutes and proposals that are submitted, uh, uh, or recommendations by the advisory board. It's on this uh, repository, so Scala Center slash advisory board on GitHub. And we've published the minutes from our last meeting. Uh, so you can see uh, a great summary of literally what everybody said, uh, what what you know the different industrial members care about. So you un you know what we're doing. There's no secrets. Um, and at the end of this meeting, we had three three uh, recommendations, which we all agreed, including the people at the Scala Center, that these are important things that we should invest our money and effort on. 
First thing was improving the governance of the community processes around Scala. Um, there are some ways that we can improve this, basically making sure that all steps and slips uh, so these are the Scala improvement proposals and the Scala improvement documents to make sure that all of these things are treated carefully and in a timely manner. Uh, so that's, that's step number one and we've already uh, begun doing that. We've already hired for, for, um, uh, for, this, for, this, for this initiative. Uh, and we also, uh, the, next, the next important initiative that was brought up to us was, well, hey, uh, there's this dotty thing that's looming on the horizon. Has anybody figured out how people f with Scala code bases are going to go to uh, Dotty or Scala 3 or whatever you want to call it, code bases eventually. There should be some, some migration path or some sort of tool defined. Uh, that was another suggestion. We agree. Well, yeah, um, a lot of, a lot of our, our energy is going into this Dotty thing existing. So we should probably begin to care about how people who have code bases now might eventually want to migrate and develop some tools for that. Uh, and a third recommendation was, hey, make sure that Scala.js doesn't die. It's a really cool project, uh, and a lot of companies are beginning to really depend on it. So I think that probably everybody can agree that these things are not in the interest of any one company. Um, I mean, actually, this is really cool that uh, the sip and slip process was unanimously voted as something that should be improved. Um, that means that co like uh, corporate members as well as community people and the rest of us just sitting in the room were like, yes, this needs to be improved. We need to find a way for, for this process to work for everybody. Um, and so you might ask, okay, well, what about Lightbend and TypeSafe? Uh, well, that's easy. It's an easy question to answer. Uh, we actually, we work together. We work orthogonally. Uh, so nothing will change about, about the stable Scala release. Scala will be, or I'm sorry, Lightbend will continue to maintain uh, the, stable, the stable Scala distribution. Um, but we will start first with uh, libraries in the Scala ecosystem. So um, to stay orthogonal, other areas of interest that we might eventually focus on uh, include things like Dottie and alternate backends like Scala.js uh, and Scala Native. But right now, um, sort of a main focus of the Scala Center should be in the direction of trying to uh, work in sort of the ecosystem and libraries and, and, and work alongside of the people at Lightbend because they're doing really a lot for us all as a community. Um, so, all right, that's, that's, I, think, I think that was, um, I think if you're interested in more, you should come up and talk to me about how this process works if I, if I haven't clarified something fully. We also have lots of documents posted online. So, uh, like, please go into detail into those, ask me questions, whatever you'd like. But I'd like to actually go into some of the fun stuff now, some of the fun stuff that we've been working on lately. So first, uh, let, let's talk about some of the projects that we've gotten started with. Um, so. I have a question that probably people already know the answer to now. What do Node, Haskell, and Rust have in, uh, have in common that Scala doesn't? Well, okay, it's a package index or manager, but whatever. We have both, both all of these, uh, whatever you want to call them, languages. I don't know, Node is not a language, but whatever. Projects, all of these things have, uh, have some way of figuring out um, you know, what other things exist in the, in, in the ecosystem. We don't. <laughs> We're a pretty popular language now, and we have no way of really finding other libraries other than just searching GitHub, searching mailing lists, looking for Gitter channels, asking Stack Overflow what's the best library for XYZ. It would be really cool if we could just see what people publish without, without sort of a, a heavy investment in sort of like going around and selling your library having to be made. If you've made something useful, uh, we should all be able to find it and use it somehow, right? You shouldn't have to go uh, travel the world and like tell people, my thing is so cool, try to come use it, use it. It shouldn't be required. If you do something useful in your free time and it could benefit a lot of people, we should be able to find it somehow. Uh, so we want to give people uh, who make great things a voice without the need uh, to you know, really market their stuff so much. So the first thing that we, we've started with is a project called Scaladex. Uh, and actually, so, I'm going to call uh, Guillaume Massé, who, who built most of this, along with John. I don't know if John's around. Um, he's going to walk you through it real quick. Um, but basically, the, the, the high-level summary is that uh, Scaladex is a package index. It's a map of the entire known Scala ecosystem. And it's based, importantly, it's based off of published Scala artifacts. So we don't index GitHub. We index published artifacts. We index uh, POMs. Uh, from, from actually Bintray. Uh, and we connect these palms with info we get from places like GitHub and eventually Stack Overflow. So we're trying to tie these 
different sources of data together and give everybody one clear place where they can come to to find Scala libraries. Um, and uh, so we've done this, like I said, by, by crawling Bintray uh, and linking basically to GitHub. Uh, and we've uh, actually, we do have a nice UI now. Um, these are the group, this is the group of people who have worked on it. And I would like to ask Guillaume to come actually walk us through it a little bit. Uh, it's now actually live and you can all access it uh, right now today. It's open source. Uh, and this is, this is what, oops. Oh no, hold on one second. This is what it looks like. Um, and I'd like to point out, I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about how this worked out, but this beautiful interface was contributed by 47 degrees. So uh, I'd really like to, again, thank them for this. I mean, it, look at how pretty it is. Hey, how are you? As software developers, we're like magicians. We create libraries out of thin air. But unlike them, we share our tricks. So this is where we can share our tricks. I'll show you um, neat things we can find. Uh, <laughs> All right. On the main page, you have the search bar. If you know what you're looking for, or if you're not you don't know what you're looking for, you can look the, through the tagging system. So we have different keywords, like if you're looking for a, a way to, to parse JSON, HTTP libraries, etc. And then for the most recent artifacts we index, we, or the most recent project, they are available on, on the front page. A project, it's something, um, it's like a GitHub repository. So we have three levels of, of, um, of things. So the first thing is it's a project, and then we have an artifact. So like a project would be a type level cats. An artifact would be something like cats core, and then you have a release. A release, it's, it's equivalent to a pom. So it's like a, a published version. So cats core version 0 0.6.0 .0 for uh, Scala.js 0.6, for example, that's a release. So this is a list of uh, recent release. And one really cool thing I found is, if you look more, on the second page, I found out that Spark just released a, a new version. So they released recently the 2.0 2 preview, and I found it out with the Scala index. Another nice thing you, that you can do is search a specific, specific project and then look its reverse dependencies or uh, dependent or libraries that depends on, on this library. Um, one example of it is Akka HTTP. Oh, yeah. If you don't, if you don't see what you're looking for, you can sort uh, with a, a various uh, sorting mechanism. Star is, is the one that is useful. So Akka HTTP is under Akka. No? Oh, that's pretty hard. So here it's the different level of, okay. So, so this is the project page. On the left, you see the project. And on the right, you see the, the two level I, I was talking about. So the artifact and then the release. Now I select, um, I select an artifact and I can select a, a specific release. So I'm interested in, in 2.4.2. And in, you can look through the dependent. There's lots of them. And one of them, for example, it's, it's a BitTorrent um, client. I, I di really didn't expect it. And you can find like lots of uh, pretty neat uh, libraries that, that are hidden through, through the dependent. So that's it for my demo. Um, so there's, there's, thanks Guillaume. Um, so there's, there's 
this is this is basically version uh, one of the package index. There's still a few things that uh, we're working on. Eventually, so this this is uh, not working today. It'll be working in I don't know a couple of days. Uh, the idea is that you can log in uh, using your GitHub uh, authentic or your your GitHub ID, and you can. Uh, basically, if you are a contributor on libraries, you should be, you'll should be able to tag libraries and say, okay, this, is, this fits into the category of parsing or this fits into the category of uh, generic programming. Or you can, there's a number of categories that you can choose from and if you're a contributor on, on, a, on a library, you can uh, tag libraries and help us categorize things that uh, maybe aren't super easy to index. Um, other things that are eventually coming, so um, we have, uh, so there. So this is a this is a mock-up um, uh, of the UI, and there's a few more things that we're we're connecting. So you're going to be able to find a bunch of statistics uh, that you get from GitHub. We do already show uh, the library. So uh, we figured out how to. Um, oops. We figured out. Sorry, I didn't expect the screens to be uh, two different displays. Okay. Uh, so we. So here, I mean, you can, you know. Uh, add your, your project's dependencies to SPT. We also have um, the Scala doc. Oh, that's the Java doc. Oh, no. Oh, no, this is horrible. Okay, uh, well, that, that link is broken. We'll have to fix that. But basically, there's a, there's a service. There's a service um, called javadoc.io that uh, basically collects all of the, the documentation artifacts uh, and we make uh, a request to them and link up all of our libraries uh, with the API docs. So um, this will be resolved soon, uh, but basically it will link to all of the Scala doc, uh, all of the Scala docs that are also published. So, okay, uh, we have uh, these licenses and dependencies um, and, um, over here, we have a few more things that are coming. Uh, basically, things like contributors. Uh, these keyword stuff will be editable soon. Um, but uh, and, and one last thing, uh, we're trying to figure out a, a nice little badge system to let projects indicate when contributors are really wanted. Sometimes people publish a project and they say, look, uh, I'm just publishing this for people to see. Uh, so we're going to try and find a way for people to indicate sort of how open to contributions different libraries are. So people who are looking to get involved in open source uh, go to the right sort of really excited to have contributors libraries. Uh, efforts like CATS, which I'm really amazed at how, how many how many contributors uh, th this group, uh, the type level people have managed to, 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 to pull in behind these projects. Um, Okay, that's all I'm going to show on that front. Um, this is all available. Sorry, I didn't tell you what the, the URL was. Uh, it's index.scalalang.org. Uh, as, as you can see, we're working on it. It's changing as we go. We're, um, we're basically indexing at this point about every day. Um, and if you want to get involved actually right now, if you want to do something to, to, to help out, if you, uh, after this talk, you end up on this on this library, uh, I'm sorry, on, this, on the package index, um, you can, uh, and you find that maybe your library isn't tagged uh, and that you would like to contribute a tag. Um, we have a couple of, of, of metadata repositories under the, Scala, under the Scala Center organization on GitHub. In particular, uh, this one here, it's called Scala, scaladex.metadata. Until that edit button is available, uh, you can at any time uh, help us by, by contributing uh, tags to the different libraries. We have, uh, at this point, we've indexed around 3,000 uh, Scala projects, which include uh, within the projects of themselves, many artifacts and whatnot. So uh, that's that's the Scala the Scala index or Scala dex. Um, and as I as I mentioned, this this has been one of these efforts where we involve uh, a bunch of people uh, who have just come to us and said, I want to try and help out somehow. And that includes uh, this really huge contribution from 47 degrees for this 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 UI. We totally didn't expect it, and we really profited all of us together having this wonderful UI to use. Um, so. Um, I mean, we can take this idea a lot further. Uh, so uh, not just using this, this idea of, you know, so we have this idea of dependence to show how widely used the library is, how many other libraries depend on it. Uh, but we can also think about doing other things like parsing build files and displaying uh, important bits of information like when libraries uh, flick on this experimental flag. And we can also, uh, you know, we, we show the licensing information up front uh, and we can, uh, also, like another idea that we, we've had with the Scala team at Lightbend is to uh, potentially use this this uh, this um, this Scala index to build 
uh, larger swaths of the Scala, the Scala ecosystem to have not just a Scala community build, but even like the idea of a, of a Scala uh, ecosystem build. We can build more and more projects potentially this way uh, by, by maybe using this API that the, uh, the Scala index provides. So that's, that's the first project that we've been working on in the last uh, couple of months. Uh, other initiatives on the radar that we, we hope to pick up next. Martin mentioned this idea of separating uh, the Scala library jar into uh, core uh, and platform. Um, so now that the compiler has stabilized, our libraries have also kind of frozen along with it. Uh, and it would be really cool to sort of, as the Scala compiler team has already been doing, be continuing to take things out and modularizing the, the, the standard library, um, but to enable people to have a batteries included sort of uh, idea of a platform, right? So um, we might ship, for example, like an EPFL uh, platform, something uh, bad or rather whatever, some, some sort of Scala-platform.jar, which includes a, a, a small collection of libraries that fit into this idea of a platform, kind of like the idea of the Haskell platform a little bit. Uh, and so must have libraries can maybe be in this thing. And uh, other groups who have, you know, other other sort of like, no, we don't like that library. That library is not so important to us. They can uh, release a, a different set of libraries. So uh, I know that the type level folks would probably like to have a type level platform, for example. Uh, so we want to open this up to everybody and make this a little bit uh, easier to sort of package kind of like what's really essential uh, in your projects. So this is a, a next important sort of step that we're going to eventually take. And then after the, the, Scala, the Scala package index, um, we're, we're going to, once we, we sort of uh, finish resolving uh, loose ends there, we're going to invest uh, a lot more effort into this idea of a Scala fiddle. So if you guys know um, um, a JS fiddle, which works like this, you write some HTML, uh, some CSS, and some JavaScript, uh, and then you can run it in the browser on the same view. We want to create something like that for Scala. So it would be really cool if people could, on Stack Overflow, uh, use this tool that, um, well, this, there's, there's a few contributors have, have worked on actually different tools, and we want to somehow combine the great things that come from all of these different tools. But uh, right now, it's called Scala Fiddle. And this, this version that I'm showing you is by Otto Kronz, um, who, who has this actually running. Uh, online, you can use it as it is right now, and it uses Scala.js under the hood. And so we would like to, as a next step, uh, work on something called Scala Fiddle, uh, and it could be used as sort of an in-browser REPL and placed on scalalang.org. Um, and just like with JS Fiddle, people can use it to uh, answer uh, questions on Stack Overflow, for example, or we could even figure out a way to embed uh, these interactive bits of things into, uh, these, uh, bits of documentation into uh, uh, websites as well. Um, so right now this is just uh, three people and we've kind of stopped development on it mostly because we, I, I was getting involved more in the Scaladex stuff um, but we're switching back into this soon and if you're interested in participating we're going to pick up the effort on this uh, in the next month or so. Um, and finally um, sort of the next thing that we're working on is improving uh, the SIP slip process. Uh, so, starting next month, uh, we will have a sort of new process in place, and our goal is to rework uh, this process and rebuild sort of the excitement and get it running again, basically. So that's another thing that we're working on. Um, that's that's really uh, all I wanted to sort of cover about like what what we've been up to, what we plan on looking at immediately next, what the advisory board was like. Hey, you guys, you should care about these things. What they told us. Uh, and I also want to just show you uh, who the people are who uh, have contributed uh, to us somehow. So these are the advisory board members. EPFL is uh, not an advisory board member, but a huge contributor. Uh, and then we have seven companies behind us now. Uh, TAPAD just joined yesterday, actually. So TAPAD is a new, new member of the advisory board, and we have a meeting. Uh, the next advisory board meeting will be in August. Uh, and if you guys have any sort of concerns or anything that you care about that the advisory board uh, should discuss, uh, we actually have, a, uh, I, I mentioned his name before, a community member who sits on the advisory board. Uh, next month we should, or next advisory board meeting, we should probably have at that point a second community member. Um, but Bill Venner is, is, is the guy to talk to who uh, is, you know, uh, sort of the voice, the voice of the community on the advisory board, so the community outside of that room. Uh, and uh, lots of other people have contributed, including uh, Heiko and Trond and several people who have, 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 have contributed to us in some way. 
Um, and if you ever want to get involved in any of the things that we're doing, actually one thing I would really like you to walk away with is the idea that um, if you're a Scala company, a Scala shop, uh, PRs are a lot more welcome to us than money. If you want to get involved helping us with something, like uh, the way that 47 Degrees uh, contributed this beautiful UI, things like this are, are really amazing contributions that benefit really a lot of people. Um, so <laughs> beyond that warm and fuzzy feeling that it gives you to give back to the community that you're already a part of, uh, it actually gets your name out, basically. It, 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 it's some visibility for participating uh, in open source, and some people care about that for recruiting, so that's maybe one reason to contribute. Um, and you know, you're also giving back to your own c uh, company if you're fixing something that everybody is in general using. So consider investing somehow in the Scala ecosystem. It doesn't have to be Scala Center, but Scala Library, Scala Compiler, one of the cool, uh, important projects in our Scala in the Scala ecosystem. Uh, consider consider in, uh, letting people give back on company time. That's a really a really great way to participate in the community. So um, so yeah, allow your developers to spend some time giving back to Scala and its ecosystem. Uh, and as I mentioned, a great example of that is this UI by 47 Degrees, so thank you guys again for contributing that. And finally, um, if there's anything you guys want to tell us, <laughs> please get in contact with us. We're, we're listening. We maybe don't respond to everything that comes up uh, on, on the Gitter channel or, or uh, on mailing lists, but we're really keeping an eye on what, what's going on and what people, what people are saying. And of course, if you don't want to directly talk to us, you can always talk to Bill as well. He brings uh, lots, I mean, he's been doing a great job of bringing people's concerns to us. So um, there's lots of people to talk to uh, that, that are part of this whole Scala Center thing. Um, and as well, if you're interested in participating at all in, in this Scala Index project, Yom, for example, is the guy to talk to. So just come talk to us. The great place, the first, the, the good place to start is, is this Gitter channel. We can route you to the appropriate place after that. So uh, that, that's about all I have to say. Um, thank you guys for, for sitting through this. Uh, and I am happy to take questions if there are any.